So welcome everybody, welcome to the Natural Areas Association State Natural Areas Program Roundtable. I'm Lisa Smith, I'm the Executive Director of the Natural Areas Association, and it is my pleasure to be joining my fellow committee members and bringing you the first of our 2021 State Natural Areas Program Roundtables. For those of you new to this forum, you'll, you will hear us refer to this as the SNAP Roundtable, just, just to clear that up. Um, it's a lot easier to say. <laughs> and it's one of our longest standing program elements. Um, these roundtables have been organized as a way for employees of state programs to come together to openly discuss and share information. NAA hosted its first formal SNAP roundtable in 2006 at our Natural Areas Conference in Flagstaff, Arizona. And while we hope to convene face to face again soon, we plan to host these roundtables virtually on a quarterly basis uh, as a means to keep us connected and communicating. So welcome. For those of you uh, new to the organization, uh, I know that there are so many familiar names on here, but some, so many folks that I hope are joining us who are, who are new to the organization today. I wanna to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, the organization is the only national nonprofit membership organization dedicated to the support and advancement of natural areas professionals who protect the world's natural areas through science-based conservation, stewardship, and advocacy. NAA represents a community who identifies challenges, develops solutions, shares critical findings, and adopts best practices in the conservation, preservation, and restoration of nature through, the networking, through networking and collaboration in large part. So NAA supports your work by bringing you the latest science and best practices through a number of mechanisms. Uh, we do this through our Natural Areas Journal, which is a peer reviewed quarterly publication, the Natural Areas Conference, which we just celebrated our very first virtual Natural Areas Conference at the end of last year, our stewardship and action field workshops, and the advisement of our newly formed Science Advisory Committee. This is a group of esteemed individuals in our field who are advising our board of directors and staff around emerging issues in connection to the identification, protection, restoration, study, public use, and stewardship of natural areas. By helping us to better understand the future of our work, we hope that we can develop the best, most effective programming for you. So that'll, we're, that's an exciting new initiative of NAA. Um, and finally, our popular webinar series. Uh, this is another way we get the latest science and practice to you. Well, let me just um, take a moment here to share uh, our, uh, a few of our upcoming webinars. We just hosted our first one in January. And if you're a member of NAA, you will be able to go back into the archives and, and see that webinar if you missed it in January. The next one is happening next week, Project Bud Burst. Uh, Mar in March, we've got a webinar entitled Current and Future Carbon Storage Capacity in a Southeastern Pennsylvania Forest. And in April, Communicating the Impact of Your Work. Uh, for those of you who work in programs that have communication staff, we highly encourage you to get that staff to take advantage of this webinar. Um, it's a good one. It'll be a great one. You'll be hearing more about uh, each of these coming up soon if you're on our list uh, serve you will or you, you are on our list so you are, you're receiving email email communications about these. So as I mentioned today we kick off our 2021 season for our state natural areas program roundtables and to give you an overview of today's roundtable is our dedicated committee chair Mike Leahy. Thanks Lisa. <clears throat> um, yes I've been involved with the state natural area program um, and NAA since uh, 2006 in that first round table we had in Flagstaff. And it's it's been a great way to communicate and, uh, and network with folks in, in state programs and related um, <clears throat> conservation agencies that work on natural areas uh, throughout the country. And today, um, I just wanna thank again, um, Lisa Smith, our executive director of, of the association, as well as other folks on the state natural area program committee, which includes Roger McCoy from Tennessee, Bill Holloman from Arkansas. And uh, recently now we're gonna have Jason Miller from Tennessee as well, and then Ryan Klopf uh, from Virginia. And today we're gonna have a, a really great presentation on um, regal fritillaries, which is a, a species of conservation concern and an invertebrate species and insect species in Missouri. And the whole focus of today's uh, webinar <coughs> and 
and state national area program meeting is the role of invertebrates in state national area programs. And we're trying to get topics that are of interest to state programs. So if you think of, of topics that you'd like for further um, meetings that we're having out here on a quarterly basis, um, either let us know through the chat or send me or Lisa an email um, as we were looking for ideas on different topics of interest. Um, insects and invertebrates, of course, is, is a, a current uh, hot topic with the importance of pollinators uh, being in the news quite a bit lately, but there's many other topics that we'd like to cover. So let us know your thoughts on that. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Chris Newbold, who is gonna be giving a, an overview of his work with the uh, state endangered and uh, recently federally petitioned to be listed, um, Regal Fritillary Spayeria idalia. And Chris, of course, is, uh, is an excellent colleague and coworker uh, here with the Missouri Department of Conservation. He's worked for the department here for at least over 20 years. And during those years, he's been involved in many aspects of tall grass prairie restoration and reconstruction. Um, <clears throat> he's published an article on the subject uh, last year in Restoration Ecology. And in that same year, he received the Bill Crawford uh, Prairie Professional of the Year Award from the Missouri Prairie Foundation, which is uh, at least locally here, a very uh, important award. Chris has been on the ground and doing the research um, of prairie reconstruction and tall grass ecosystems now for uh, many, many years and uh, has an undergraduate degree from the University of Missouri and a graduate degree from University of Tennessee. And so without further ado, um, we're going to go here ahead and hear from Chris and then we'll have some time for questions and answers after Chris's talk. And then we have eight different um, smaller presentations on the role of invertebrates in state and county natural area programs that uh, Lisa will moderate. Well, thank you. Well, I thank you for having me come in and visit with you today a little bit about this uh, Regal Fridlery project that we've been uh, working on here in Missouri for the past uh, few years. And uh, I've got myself and I've got Jared Hubner's uh, operator on here because this is a, uh, uh, has started off as a cooperative project between the Department of Conservation and the Missouri Prairie Foundation. So I want to just kind of recognize everybody um, who's been involved in um, uh, this project. But uh, I want to visit with you a little bit about some of the Regal Fritillary surveys and, and work that we've done in uh, southwestern and western Missouri um, to give us an idea of, of kind of what the distribution of abundance of Regals looks like here in the state. Uh, the Regal Fritillary is a uh, tall grass prairie species. For those of you who may not be aware, there's probably a lot of folks on this, this project or on this, this call that are aware of, of the life history of this species. But it's a tall grass prairie species, and I, I would tell you that it's a ruminant tall grass prairie species, and that's because um, it's very closely tied to its larval food sources, which are going to be violets. And particularly here, at least here in Missouri, um, three um, violets that you typically find on our tall grass prairies. Um, they will use a lot of other sources uh, as nectar as adults, but they are pretty much tied to those uh, violet species that you find on prairies. And uh, you typically are going to find those prairies on our remnant sites and not uh, in reconstructions and restorations, which we'll, we'll maybe talk a little bit about more here, here in a second. But to give you a little bit of more background on the species, uh, it is a sexually dimorphic species. Um, it's a, it's a uh, a large showy butterfly that uh, on these tall grass prairies, if you haven't seen them before, they're pretty uh, not, they're hard, they're easy to, to spot. They're not hard to miss. Large orange butterflies, but they have this very distinctive uh, navy blue dark hind wing. Um, you can tell males from females based upon the, the uh, color of the last row of, uh, of uh, uh, spots on the hind wing. The males will have these uh, last row of orange dots. The females will have these uh, row of uh, white dots. And for a life history, to get an idea, they, the, the, they have one uh, um, generation per year. The adults, excuse me, the males emerge first, uh, typically here in Missouri in late May or early June. The males come out, they fly around the prairies for a couple of weeks, uh, setting up territories, waiting for the females to emerge. And the females actually emerge later, about three, oh, three to four weeks later, late June to early July is when their emergence typically starts. 
Both sexes fly around on the prairies together, breeding. Uh, the males then a few weeks later start to die off and the females then go through this reproductive dive pause through the late summer into early, late summer, early fall. And then they start laying their eggs on the prairie and then the females will die. Um, the eggs will hatch in the fall, the larva emerge, go down into the prairie litter and basically overwinter as larva uh, in that prairie litter. And then next spring, when spring rolls around, Violets are some of the first things that start to grow and bloom on the prairie. Those larvae start to become active, feed on those violets uh, through the spring, uh, and then um, transform back into adults um, into the uh, early summer, or in the early summer, start to transform, transform back into adults with the males are coming out first, completing the life cycle. So if you think about that, and that, that larva being overwintering in the, the prairie litter, um, they are susceptible to our disturbances um, on this prairies, um, particularly during the you know, winter time. So regal fritillaries, uh, their core of their range occurs in the Great Plains, um, typically here in, in the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Western Missouri, Iowa, um, but historically they did stretch across the upper Midwest and uh, up and down the uh, much of the eastern seaboard. Um, in recent times, however, uh, they've pretty much disappeared east of the Mississippi River, um, except for some populations that are still uh, in Illinois and Wisconsin and in one isolated population in Pennsylvania. Um, but the core of their range is in the uh, Great Plains uh, portion of, of, uh, of, of the country. And in all the states that they have occurred, they do occur or historically occurred, they are a species of conservation concern with the exception of right now Kansas. Um, here in Missouri, they're listed as an S3 species um, with most of their occurrences occurring in Western and Northern Missouri where we had our prairie um, communities. But if you look at records in the last 15 years, uh, even uh, those occurrences have been shrinking and, 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 and falling back to just some core areas in Northwestern Missouri and in Southwestern Missouri. Because of this, the Regal was petitioned to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to be listed in the Endangered Species Act. And in 2015, the service found that their listing may be warranted. So they were, they're currently under a status review with uh, an expected decision on uh, the listing status in, coming in 2022. So because of this, uh, a few of us in the state thought this might be a good opportunity for us to go out and try to get an idea of what our current situation, um, our distribution and abundance situation of regals was in the state so that we can inform that um, listing decision. So we wanted to get an idea, not only where regal fritillaries were located in the state, but how healthy or sustainable were the populations. So that makes, uh, makes you lead to a question of what does a healthy population look like? And tell you the truth, I don't know if, I, if anybody actually has answered that question, but I did a little, did a little bit of digging around on uh, the nature serve site and got an idea of how they ranked their populations from uh, as an A ranked all the way down to a D ranked population and generally what those population sizes were like. Um, and as you can see, really you're looking at these A ranked populations of several thousand individuals. And those are the populations that are probably sustainable, whereas those, those B, C and, and definitely the D ranked populations may not have long-term sustainability. Um, NatureServe did mention that uh, in, in my review there that A rank populations are, we're not certain if any of them actually do exist, but there's some speculation that if they did exist, the highest likelihood is that they occurred maybe along the Kansas Missouri border, where some more recent surveys had indicated that they were still relatively common. Um, and uh, uh, again, to get an idea of, of, of how many numbers is required to keep a, a stable population on NatureServe, it was mentioned that in the Eastern populations that were all around 100 to 200 individuals in the 1980s, they were all extirpated by about 1991. So we're, we really are probably looking for those A-ranked several thousand individuals to think that we've got a long-term viable population. So I didn't mention I am not an entomologist. And the reason I'm involved in this is because I'm, I kind of enjoy trying to figure out how to count things and, 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 and go through that process. So in thinking about how to answer some of these questions that was a curiosity to me, um, I thought, well, how can we go out and do a surveys to kind of come up with a simple survey methodology that anybody can do that would not be very labor intensive, that would not require a lot of resources, but would still give us some decent information about potential population sizes. 
And what I decided to do was to adopt this dependent double observer methodology, which uh, had been published in 2000, uh, looking at doing some bird surveys. And, and we modified that for, for uh, uh, counting regals by doing it along transects. Um, but basically what this dependent double observer methodology does is it has two observers, one serves as the primary and one serves as the secondary observer. And basically you walk these transects and we count, we count regals that we see. I also did, uh, when we did these surveys, we, we classified them in distance classes uh, of these five meter distance classes out to 15 meters. We did count beyond 15 meters, but, um, but basically anything beyond 15 meters just got lumped out that it's out there somewhere. And then these surveys were done under typical butterfly survey protocols um, when, when uh, temperature and, and weather was cert under uh, certain conditions and above 70 degrees. And because of the regal, of trying to time our surveys with the uh, regal fritillary peak populations or what we thought peak populations were gonna be, uh, we, we surveyed those things in late June into early July when we thought both the males and females would be emerged. So this is just a schematic of kind of what a survey would look like. This transect was 200 meters long. Uh, we had a primary observer who would lead the survey. The secondary observer would follow behind and they would uh, record the information. Basically, what this way this works is the primary observer tells the secondary observer if they see a regal and in what distance band they occurs in. The secondary observer records that information, and then the secondary observer is not sharing information with the primary observer, but they're also looking for and recording any regals that they observe that the primary observer had missed. So, in this way, you can get an idea of what actual detectability is, and then with once you've determined detectability you can then correct for the number of individuals that you think that you're missing on any surveys that you're doing. So we laid transects out across these prairie parcels that we wanted to survey. They were laid out on a north, south, east, west basis. They were laid out systematically across the prairie. So that basically about one transect occurred on every 40, 40 acres. And that was, a, that was because we tried to keep transects at a minimum of 400 meters apart. And that was pretty much just a wild guess by me to say, 400 meters is far enough distance that when we count one transect and then move to the next transect, a regal would not have beaten us over there and we counted him twice on another on another transect. Um, 200 meter long transects, uh, the, the belt width that we we're surveying is 30 meters wide. So that basically means we're measuring about 0.6 hectares or 1.5 acres. That's only about 3% of that 40 acre block that we're looking at. So it's a pretty low intensity survey methodology, uh, at least the way we set it up. So we did this in 2018 and we picked, uh, and this is a, a picture of uh, the Osage Plains Eagle region and these circles are indicating some of the prairie complexes that we surveyed. In 2018, we started uh, by looking at uh, three smaller prairie parcel uh, complexes. I'm gonna call complex this uh, geographic area that contains multiple prairie parcels. And these prairie uh, complexes contain a combination of Missouri Prairie Foundation, and Missouri Department of Conservation, Nature Conservancy, and even private land uh, hay prairies that occurred in, in some of these areas that, that we had uh, permission to um, survey. And in 2018, we did that. We ended up with some what we thought were biologically good numbers. So we expanded our surveys and we did those in 2019 and 2020. And then in three years, we've, we've done 288 total transects, about 40, uh, prairie parcels in, in these six prairie complexes in, in Western Missouri. All right, like I said, I kind of like to count things. So here's the either the boring part of the presentation or this part that I like, which is kind of looking at some of the numbers, but basically this is kind of, this is, this is what we found over those three years. We were, since we were doing repeated counts um, with double observers, we can come up with detection rates. And what we found was that detection rates of regal fritillaries really didn't differ between years, observers, are really many of the factors that we looked at. And they averaged around 65 to 70% detection rates. Um, I put the, on this graph, you can see that there was variability amongst observers, but they were all relatively close together with, with, and with maybe, maybe some had large confidence intervals and that's because of the number of transects that they surveyed. I've put this, 30, this red line on the 30% detection rate as a reference point, because when your, your detection rates start to drop below 30%, the, the abundance estimates that you'll generate or start to become pretty unreliable. And you can see that for the most part, most of all of our detection rates are above 30%. Uh, that occurred in 2018, 19, and 20 also. 
In 2020, we did do multiple surveys. Most of these surveys were done uh, one time. We would go out to a prairie at one time and count the survey and we were done with it. But in 2020, we started counting the uh, cold camp prairie areas. Uh, and I'll show you on a map where that is. But uh, we counted them multiple weeks in a row, uh, starting in the third week of June and went to the third week of July to kind of see if detection and abundance differed over that time. We expected abundance to, I didn't know if detection would. Here's a, here's a, 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 a graph of the detection rates that we estimated. You can see that they relatively stayed the same, except for this third week of July, which our detection rates did drop and this 95% confidence interval did drop below the 30%. So, so basically it's telling us when the, and this is the time when basically the males have died off and it's just the females out on the prairie, detections do drop, uh, detectability drops of regals at that time. Uh, this is just another little graph, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but you can look at detection rates like the, um, with variables that you, you, you map or record with it, like time of day. So basically we saw the detections generally increased as the day got all older or longer, which makes sense, um, but these confidence intervals really didn't you know, differ across the day, so, so there really wasn't, it wasn't a significant uh, effect. So once you've got detection rates, you can estimate uh, what your abundances are. And so this is uh, looking at those cold camp prairies that I mentioned we counted multiple times in 2020, starting in the third week of June to the third week of July. And this is looking at the abundance estimates, or actually the, the density estimates, or the number of regals per hectare um, that we estimated across the, that time period. And you can see that you've got this increase in, in population size to about the fourth week of June, and then it drops off toward that third week of July. So again, this is as males are on the prairies, the females are emerging, uh, the females and males are out together, and then basically the female or the males start dying off and it's the females out on the prairie later into the summer. So again, it does kind of confirm that if we really want to find that peak population size that at least here in Missouri, that fourth week of June seems to be the, the time to, to be out there looking for regals. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but basically this is the uh, density estimates for all those prairie parcels that we surveyed um, by year. Um, and uh, you can see that um, I've kind of lumped these together by the complex, which you see down here below, and then these are the prairie parcels. Our range of densities estimate range from zero to 16 regals per hectare with a mean of 3.3 regals per hectare uh, in all the areas that we, we surveyed. This is similar or decent numbers that, to some estimates that were generated in 2007 from Eastern Missouri uh, using some distance modeling, a different modeling technique. But if you look at this map also, you can see that there are some areas like Golden Prairie Complex and Linden Prairie Complex that had very little or no regals. Um, some areas like the Taborville Complex, which kind of had around that average, and then some complexes that had a paintbrush prairie, this paintbrush prairie complex actually had probably, the high, well, did have the highest density of regals of all the, the complexes that we surveyed. So when you take those distance or density estimates and you multiply that by the number of acres that you surveyed out there, this is where we can kind of come up with a raw number of what's our population size out there. So this is the coal camp prairies that I mentioned up here. Uh, we think we have probably around 3,000, or at least on the areas we surveyed, around 3,000, or I think there's around 3,000 regals out there when we counted them. There's probably actually more because there's a lot of private land hay prairie in this area that we did not survey. There's probably between three and five, and again, this is that, that high density area up in this part of the, the, the state. We had lower densities at the uh, Wakanta uh, Prairie Complex and the Bushwhacker uh, Prairie Complex, but because there were more acres in those areas, we think those populations are probably just as high or higher than what we've got up here in Sedalia, uh, the Sedalia area prairies. And then we do have areas down here in the south, um, uh, uh, the Linden's Prairie area, we did not detect regals, and then some of the Golden Prairie area in Pennsylvania, these some of these smaller prairie complexes had, you know, smaller numbers um, that, you know, may not be they're probably looking at B-ranked populations in these areas. So that's kind of what we came up with with our transect surveys in 2019 and 2020. I think Steve Bubeck is on this call also, but he worked with the, some folks from Central Missouri University to do some mark release work uh, on these Sedalia area prairies that we, we were surveying. And the reason for this mark release work was to get some more information of what regal movement looks like between these prairie parcels that are scattered across the landscape. And then also we wanted to use it as kind of a gold standard to test this the regal 
or excuse me, this transex methodology to see that our numbers actually make sense or not. And this last year, the re, uh, we completed that work and uh, Dr. Dan Marshlack from Central Missouri University provided us an estimate of regals on, on four prairies, uh, friendly drover, paintbrush and marker prairies in the uh, Sedalia area prairies. And to my dismay, um, his estimates come up to about 600 or about 700 regals is what he was estimating on those prairies. And if you took my modeling numbers, basically I'm estimating about double that 1400 regals. So I felt like, well, shoot, that didn't work out like I thought I did. But then I read, in, I was reading in the re, in their results a little bit cl closer, and looked at on the areas that are more, the, you know, mark release is a lot more intensive. You can't chase regals all over the place. You have to kind of pick an, pick an area, and you have to and survey it much more intensely. And the areas that they surveyed on these areas amounted to about 290 acres. The areas I surveyed out amounted to about 640 acres. So just doing some simple math on that basically ends up that it, you know. 296, 700 regals on 290 acres comes out to be about 5.8 regals per hectare. My numbers ended up ended up being about 5.5 regals per hectare. So I'm not exactly sure I did it right thinking about trying to standardize those the areas surveyed, but um, it's close enough that I'm back to thinking that this transect survey data is real good at the giving us relative abundances and, and uh, across areas that we can compare. And that's a good idea because if you look at the regal dis, regal um, transect data, you can look at things like where are the, I mean, here's a picture of Wakanta and you, uh, Prairie. You can see that regals are not distributed evenly across that area. They're very high densities in some areas, low densities in other areas, and completely missing in other areas. And this is important if we want to start looking at things like management effects of time since burning, grazing, hang, things like that. And I think there's some additional work being. Uh, uh, proposed to, to answer some of those questions. Just anecdotally, I will tell you in areas that where reconstructions have occurred, which I think is in this area of Wakanta, we don't find the regals. Um, in the areas where recent burns have been done, we, we find very low densities of uh, regals and even though there's some prairie disturbances. It seemed like those areas that were had been set uh, um, with little prairie disturbance in a while is where the highest regal densities uh, probably occurred. So there probably is some more digging into uh, their abundance um, abundances that can be done and should be done to understand them a little bit better. So to finish this up, just to uh, um, point out why, why is this important to uh, kind of get an idea of abundance levels? Um, well, I would argue it's because it would help us identify where do we have the highest populations where we can do additional uh, prairie work. The Sedalia area prairie uh, has scattered ruminant prairies around, including a lot of private land hay prairies. And so it's an area for us to look at with the highest density being at, it, at that area that we really ought to be in there working with private landowners and looking for additional land acquisitions and things like that for that species in that area. Um, so um, um, that also helps identify areas where we really should work on our, some prairie reconstruction work uh, to kind of build that landscape back and kind of tie those, help those, those populations or those species tie themselves back together uh, that are using those scattered parcels around. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time into this, but just this is just to show you uh, a recent re, re, reconstruction paper that we did. We've got a pretty, what I would call a pretty successful reconstruction. Um, and I'm just going to point you to this part of the graph down here. This green line is this reference a remnant community, a prairie community that we're comparing our reconstructions to. And you can see that over time, we've done reconstructions that do a pretty good job of getting close to that re uh, remnant prairie, but they never get exactly to that remnant prairie. Um, they never equal what our remnants look like. And if you look at some species that are sometimes missing from those uh, rem uh, reconstructions, violets a lot of times will stick out. And so if we're gonna play a role in, in conserving regals beyond just conserving the remnant prairies that are out there, but looking to bring them back and expand their, their range. Uh, we're gonna have to somehow figure out how to solve this problem of getting violets back into some of our reconstructions. And I would argue that maybe trying to figure out better ways of propagating violet species for reconstructions is important. And I know that there are some folks out there that have had some success, but here in Missouri, we've had very limited success of being able to do that. And, and for the most part, violets are missing from almost all the reconstruction or restoration or reconstructions that I've seen uh, in the state. So, so I guess I would just say that that's kind of my closing uh, theme of this is the next thing we need folks to try to help help solve. So with that, I'm more than happy taking questions if I, I left time. Chris, there's a, a couple of questions on the um, on the chat. 
regard okay. in terms of uh, Rick Myers from uh, Virginia asked, are these prairies managed with fire? And of course, some are, some have been managed as um, hay, they've all been managed as hay meadows um, for years and years before um, fire has been applied. That's basically what, what preserved a lot of these remnant prairies. And then Theo Whistle from Arkansas had a question about the seasonality of burning and Boy, yeah, that it gets complicated pretty quickly in terms of the management history of all these areas. Yes, uh, um, and to answer your question, yes, there was a mixture and our surveys were not designed to answer those questions uh, because we were basically just getting an idea of what the uh, uh, populations look like. So we didn't stratify transects across, you know, different treatments. That would be the next thing I would like to do um, because I'd like to answer those questions. I will tell you anecdotally, that um, the private land hay prairies that we surveyed, and again, we didn't, we selected certain prairies that we had permission to be on, and we knew Regal's were at, so we may have been selecting the highest quality stuff. But um, the, 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 rim, uh, the, the private land hay prairies that were being managed by prairies, they typically had the highest densities of Regal's. Um, and we did notice areas that in this coal camp prairie where we surveyed for several years, we had seen prairie, we had, we had seen regals for several years using specific parts of that prairie. And then a, a fire, a spring winter fire would come in and um, uh, would, they, burn, they would burn in January, February in that prairie. The next year, regals would not be on that portion of the prairie. And you could actually even watch males, they would fly around the areas that had existing uh, litter uh, on that prairie, they would fly over, and this is again, anecdotal observations, but you'd see them fly over into that uh, burned area for about 30 seconds and then right back into the litter area. Um, later in the year, when the females are out looking for places to lay eggs, they're probably spreading around using more parts of that prairie, but early in the year when the males are emerging uh, and starting to look for females, they're keying in on those, those undisturbed areas. Uh, we didn't look at seasonality of fire. Again, that would be something else to look at in the future that I, I am intrigued about and would like to think about. Um, but um, just knowing the life history of that species and knowing that it's an overwintering larva or a larva in the, on the ground, anything that's going to be burning during the dormant season is probably not going to be good for it, at least in the short term. And, and, and again, that's, that's that prairie paradox, which I mentioned a paper that's been published on that. There's a, you know, that prairie paradox of how do you, we know we have to put fires on that prairie to, to, for the health of that prairie, figuring out how to do that on these small isolated prairies and still maintain this species that could be detrimentally affected by those dormant season fires is, is a, a, a puzzle to solve. Uh, Chris asked if you've considered or the department's considered delaying planting the dominant grasses in your reconstruction to help less competitive forbs like viola species to establish? We have, and actually one of the papers that we, uh, that, 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 that table that I provided to you or showed in this presentation came from that. That was one of the points that was made in, in areas where we've done different site preparation work, areas where we've done work to, and management to minimize the establishment and dominance of those grasses, we get a better quality of, of uh, broadleaf um, uh, prairie planting. Um, but having said that, we've we found no methodology that's basically helped find uh, uh, solve that prairie problem or prairie violet problem. And the big issue is because you cannot collect enough seed. Um, the, the seed is extremely hard to collect and that that's, that we do collect, we've thrown out at different times of the year. We've sent the seed house growers to try to grow plugs so that we know that we got viable seed growing. We can very, we very rarely get a lot of good seed off of it. Um, so there's a seed collection, seed viability problem that's kind of the bottleneck with that species, I think. <laughs> there was another question about whether we've used grazing as part of the management of these sites and at what content taper, but we have used grazing uh, in combination with prescribed fire and other management tools. Um, <clears throat> but again, we don't have the data to really say one way or the other. Um, Chris, yeah, I mean, I'll, we I'll, haven't, again, we haven't I'll, done the management look at it yet. We have not. We have not looked at the management in a rigorous way. Again, I can give you anecdotal information, which again, I kind of hate to do because it's basically, we, have, we haven't really got good controls on it. But I 
the areas that we surveyed at Wakanta, Taborville, High Lonesome, the areas that we were using grazing, we typically saw lower re regal densities than what we saw on private land hay prairies. That's not to say that the regals, the regal densities were different in area, other areas where we were using, you know, pretty frequent fire management um, or on reconstructions where we saw very little, if any, regals. Um, but, um, and, and the, the, the grazing management, it's not been tweaked out to say, is it the grazing? Is it the, the use of fire in conjunction with grazing? Who knows? Um, but uh, I think those disturbance, it's a, it is a very paradox species in that the disturbances, frequent disturbances are probably not long-term beneficial to it, but, but it has to have disturbance to maintain that prairie uh, community. Um, so yeah, I, we haven't looked at it that closely, but it's there's questions to be asked in my mind. Mike, maybe one more question. I see one from Claiborne Woodall. Yeah, well, otherwise, well, <laughs> there's lots of questions with this topic. Um, okay. Claiborne was asking, yeah, whether we use um, on some of these small patch prairies with regals, um, uh, patchy prescribed burns. Um, typically what we've done is just burn no more than a third, sometimes up to a half of, of a remnant. In recent years, we've learned the hard way. Um, um, but yeah, in recent years, we've we've gotten smarter um, than in the past. But yeah, we have done some patchy burns, um, all, as well as more typically just um, burning just a portion of the prairie. Um, Yes, we have. And I will also say that Mark Regal's work, I will mention that there has been some, uh, there's evidence that those those regals, um, even even males, uh, I, before even the males are moving between prairie parcels. So we've got some areas in that study area prairie where we've had, we have uh, documentation of males moving. Uh, Dr. Marshall Lack had, had, has, has released per, uh, regals at one prairie and seen them show up on another prairie about a mile away cross four lane highways, things like that. So they are gonna move around and find new locations. Um, how much of that is happening, we don't know, but but that is happening. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, I guess, Lisa, we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll turn it over to you for our next series of uh, presenters. Okay, great. Chris, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, Mike, thank you. And don't go away because there are gonna be questions I'm sure that come up that uh, you know, you'll be able to chime in on. With that, we've got eight presenters for you, and uh, I'll introduce, I'll be moderating. Um, these are quick five-minute presentations or less with about five minutes for Q&A and transition, so I'm going to be a bit of a taskmaster today, making sure we stay on time so that everybody's heard, and, um, and there's plenty of time for Q&A. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first presenter, and that is Jeff Johnson. And Jeff is with the Ohio DNR. Please, Jeff, feel free to say anything more about your role with DNR. But Jeff is going to uh, share a little bit about management strategies related to the use of prescribed fire and native plantings for pollinators in Ohio. And Jeff, if you're going to go ahead and share your video and share your screen, I'm going to um, I'll I'll uh, stop my video. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, uh, like I think please, uh, Jeff Johnson. Uh, been the chief now of uh, Natural Areas Observed here in Ohio for the last two years, came in with a new administration. Uh, it's been a, a really good time for us the last couple of years, too. So budget increases, it's just been a phenomenal time for our program now. Um, just going to give a very uh, non-technical, this is not scientific, very anecdotal kind of presentation. Um, to uh, talk about how we are changing some of our uh, ideas about how we manage our sites and things. And one of those is uh, the role of fire that we have. Uh, a lot of the sites we do manage are, are fire dependent ecosystems. And uh, you know, it's when, when I started with the division about 26 years ago, um, it, was, it was very much a uh, burn everything as much as you can and, and that's the best thing for it. So this was a typical fire you'd see, lots of big flames, very exciting. It was always fun to be out on these burns. Uh, and then you, know, you got done with the fire, and this is what you were looking for. We would actually measure our success on the percentage of black that we had. So if you were anything under 80%, you had a bad burn. It just wasn't a good day if you got under 80%. So 
Uh, I think a lot of people probably had this kind of mentality with, with fire. Um, but we get a lot of criticism, obviously, the Lepidopteran societies uh, are, are not real pleased when they see the, uh, something like this when they drive by our site. So we're looking at different things we could do. Uh, and if you look at around the state of Ohio, you know, north, northeast, you've got, uh, or northwest, I mean, we've got the oak openings area with carnivore blue butterflies and the lupines. Down south, we've got some fire dependent habitats, uh, Edward Hare Streak and then the Olive Hare Streak really unique types of, of habitats and species. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't impacting these. So it's like, what can we do uh, to try to have less of an impact on, on some of these invertebrate species? And, and obviously other species we probably don't even know are out there. Uh, so we started shifting our thinking on, on, on what we're doing. So one of the things we look at is actually the technique, the firing technique of how we actually light fire. Uh, there on the left, you can see a woodlands. When I first started, we would have been in there stripping that off. So we would have gotten all that to burn. Pretty much now we, we lay a line. If, if the fire wants to carry it, it goes through, that's great. If not, uh, on the right, you can see one of our uh, really high quality sites we've got uh, down in Adams County in the southern part of the state where we do have Edwards Hair Streak and, and uh, the Olive Hair Streak both. Um, it's, we, we've gone from lighting head fires, which you can kind of see the smoke in the upper right portion of that picture. That's blowing uh, kind of to the from left to right. It'd be very easy to go down to the bottom of the hill, light a head fire, and just let this thing go across. It'd be a lot prettier to look at. But what we end up doing is a lot more strip firings, and that allows a lot more backing fire. Here you can see in the foreground of the picture where there's still a lot of standing uh, vegetation that, you know, it's dead vegetation from previous year that didn't get consumed. So it was still there. Lots of little patchiness that we get. And we're starting to see where we're looking at, you know, if we're getting 70% black, that's, that's more of a, a productive fire that we're looking for. Backing fire still does uh, get the results we want, though. Stop killing those woody species, getting rid of the duff to allow the, the, the prairie species to have a better chance to grow. So uh, firing technique is one thing we've changed. And then fuel moisture is another big one. This is a savanna we've got um, in, in kind of north central Ohio. It's a tremendous area. It's, it's only 30 some acres, but it's still one of our largest remaining savannas in the state. Uh, very high quality. It used to be one of those things we'd look at uh, our fire prescriptions. Like, you know, we wouldn't burn these unless we had three days without rain. And we'd come in, we'd put a fire on here, huge 10, 15, 20 foot flames, reaching up, catching trees on fire. It was, it was really something to see, you know, that whole image of what it, it looked like um, back in the, in the prairies and savannas before settlement got here. Uh, and what we've now do is we look at it and say, like, well, you know, one day without rain is enough. It leaves a little more moisture in there. We do produce a little more smoke, but it keeps the flame lengths down, still gets the, the vegetation off, but it leaves a lot of this patchiness. So you'll see some of the patches there in the, in the foreground that didn't completely burn. And, that, and that's actually pro providing a lot of this habitat refuge, if you will, for a lot of the species that uh, we probably were typically burning up a majority of our invertebrates when we uh, used to do our burns and we're much more cognizant now. Somebody else mentioned, I, I think, uh, looking at, you know, when you have a single site, this is one of our sites down in Southern Ohio in Adams County. Uh, we burn probably around, oh, I don't know what's in there, about 60 acres or so of, of these sites. And, and all you can see the red lines are there are all the breaks that we have. So we actually break this, uh, what could be burned in probably two units up into lots of units. And we actually pick and choose and, and make sure that we're not burning all the units in any one year makes it more difficult with our weather we've had, uh, trying to get enough years in a row that we can actually get all these sites burned. But we're finding that leaving these patches, we're seeing recovery of, of insect communities much, much quicker when we're not burning everything all at once. So those are just some things on, on the, the burning front that we're doing to, to try to help pr uh, promote uh, the invertebrates. Change gears completely on that. Uh, just another thing that we're trying to do locally within our division uh, on a statewide level. Um, last year was actually the first year the governor, you can picture there, Governor DeWine signing into law. Uh, April is Ohio Native Plant Month. So we actually have an official Native Plant Month in Ohio now. Of, and uh, we're, we were doing programming associated with that. There's other initiatives across the state, the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative. Department of Transportation does a lot of work with, with roadside plantings. Uh, so we actually thought, you know, one thing that was kind of missing was the, the person's backyard and we wanted to do something ourselves. We came up with the Grow Native Initiative. Uh, it's patterned after some other states have some. I think Missouri actually has one uh, that may be actually called Grow Native as well. Trying to get away from the pictures you see, though, where landscaping is this, you know, really pretty types of grasses and really showy flowers, but it's really not doing much for our ecology here. So we want to try to convert that over and, and you get much more of a, a native uh, feel to things helping promote uh, the pollinators and providing the habitat for the, the species that, that really are, do suffer when you see a lot of the non-native landscapes. 
Uh, so it, within the initiative, we've got different levels of commitment. So we're going to be rewarding people for how much effort they want to put into this uh, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum levels. Those will all be tied in with uh, the percentage of their landscapes, which contain uh, native species and, and which ones contain non-native. Uh, non-natives are not necessarily all bad. Obviously, if there's invasive species in there, you're not going to qualify for any of these. Uh, but we're, we're really trying to promote the, the use of, of uh, native species. Looking at the community level, so cities could do this much on uh, like a Tree City USA type concept. We're trying to get local businesses to get them involved. But most importantly for us is the individuals looking at, you know, going from these kind of sterile landscapes that you see, uh, very much a, a non-native uh, plantings around a lot of these houses and changing it over to something like this, where you actually have uh, less maintenance to take care of because you don't have the mowing, it's, you know, it's less impact, but you get all these species. And it's amazing what you can bring into a, a backyard or a, a landscape area just by using natives. So that's one of our biggest things right now working with uh, different types of businesses. Uh, there's several uh, golf courses now around the state, uh, which are using all their uh, rough areas and, and their non-green and putting areas. Uh, they're transplant forming those into native prairie plantings. Uh, cemeteries, uh, some of the townships are starting to let those revert back and, and plant those into prairies uh, for, for saving and maintenance and just any kind of business in a backyard area to install some of these uh, Thing. So that's kind of where we're at with a, a couple of just of the th things we're doing here in Ohio. Like I say, not very technical, but ju just send some pretty pictures and, and hopefully some direction that uh, we're trying to move here to, to, to make a difference. So thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Jeff. That's that's really that's a lot of great work being done there in Ohio. Any questions for Jeff? I, uh, there have been a couple comments in the chat uh, just to draw everybody's attention. Mike Leahy mentioned that Missouri does have a Grow Native program and it's housed at the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Um, and Rick made a comment that it's so great to hear that Ohio natural areas and preserves has seen a budget increase in program recovery in the last few years. So I would agree with that. And I will throw one more thing out that I just heard this last week. Uh, the same people that got uh, put the initiative to get the uh, April's Native Plant Month in Ohio, uh, they've also contacted their uh, U.S. legislators. And there's now a proposal to actually create a April is Native Plant Month at a, at a national level. Uh, we're, we're putting some comments together on that because we're a little concerned that it's very Midwest centric uh, and may not suit uh, the entire country. Uh, but just to let everybody know that there is actually a push now that uh, that'll go through the Senate, I think, is where they're gonna introduce that to see if we can't get a, a national month for native plants across the country. Fantastic, good luck. Uh, okay, we've got we've got time for one question here. Have you shared your perspective on approximately 70% black being successful with partner agencies that conduct fire management? This goes back to one of your earlier slides. And if so, what is their response? You know, we, we haven't really shared that because it is very unscientific. It's it's very anecdotal. We're just looking at it and, and we like to see some of that green unburnt space. And it's like a 70% is just kind of a ballpark for us. Um, a lot of other agencies I know in Ohio are doing the same things, though. I mean, like the Nature Conservancy, which they haven't burned for a while because we've got some issues with their, their uh, burn program here in Ohio. Um, but, but there are other agencies that are also trying to incorporate leaving some of that, that, uh, that green space or unburned areas. So I don't know that 70% is kind of a, a universal number, but it's, it's definitely gone away from that. You know, we want to see 95 to 100% black down to let's do something reasonable and leave some of those. And we're starting to see a lot more people subdividing big units into smaller units so you can just do patches of those. Uh, it does make it harder to burn, but, but uh, we're, we're seeing a lot more of that. Excellent. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. All right, next up, um, we've got Tom Swinford and Tom is with the Indiana DNR Nature Preserves Program. And Tom is here to give us an update on Odinate habitat restoration, Mitchell Sater conservation, cobblestone tiger beetle planting, rusty patch bumblebee surveys, and the monarch butterfly state plan. Hi, Tom. Great, I'm with the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, uh, state of Indiana. And within our division of nature preserves, we house our, our Indiana Heritage Program as well as our nature preserves program, uh, which oversees the management, restoration, and a lot of the habitat work. But, you know, I just wanted to have a chance to give uh, everyone a little bit of an update on some of our uh, urgent, our priorities and initiatives, I guess, on uh, invertebrate conservation. And uh, basically, it's focused around 
uh, you know, gathering more information with surveys, we still have a lot of gaps there for invertebrates. Uh, and also we're aggressively trying to acquire important priority invertebrate parcels and add on to existing core relic natural areas. And thirdly, we're really trying to recover a marginal or really dysfunctional habitats that are around some of our really high quality areas and uh, uh, all of this when funding is available. So Odinates are uh, something we uh, have pretty good expertise in house with and, and do have uh, ranks developed uh, for them. And uh, we do use them as uh, sort of a, a species indicators. Uh, the Nanothemus bella, the elfin skimmer is a real northern uh, dragonfly that's uh, conservatively uh, found in really high quality peatland habitats, bogs and fens. And northern wetlands are something we're really focusing on. We have uh, many of our uh, northern invertebrates, that's their, their habitat. So uh, with Odinates, we've been uh, both doing the restoration, but also prioritizing some land acquisition that contains uh, elfin skimmer and others. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're working to restore rare Odinate habitat in nor and northern wetlands, kind of an emphasis of the division right now. And uh, division also actively working to acquire northern wetlands with known rare Odinates. You know, the big things, the threats are northern wetlands and we're really, uh, pride ourselves on our large acreages where, uh, you know, the hybrid cattails uh, in our sedge meadows and high quality bogs, here's a bog, and we're really aggressively uh, treating the hybrid uh, type of problems. And uh, also identifying areas adjacent. This is a, a prairie fan in Northern Indiana that uh, over my career, approximately 30 years, uh, has been completely lost apparently to reed canary grass. So we found some funding there and uh, did a, a do over. We also are very interested in the hydrology of these northern wetlands, realizing what a, a key uh, key role they play and trying to do some hydrologic recovery here of groundwater as well with some drainage styles. And uh, actually immediately we did uh, reseed it as well and put in a lot of uh, plugs of uh, some sedges. But we saw an amazing flush of uh, Eupatorium or Maculatum, the uh, spotted Joe pie weed, a real fan indicator plant here, really uh, was not evident at all and was released in one year. So that's sort of the types of uh, large scale uh, lift sort of projects of really dysfunctional wetlands that we've owned for years and uh, trying to bring them up. Yeah, also at this site, uh, we did have uh, old records of um, white lady slippers and they uh, were found kind of in a fringe area as well. So a lot of good elements in that would, was uh, close to being lost. Uh, Mitchell Sater butterfly, something, you know, we've uh, saw a decline from a handful of sites to one extant site in Indiana now over the last 30 years. Uh, and uh, all of the, the extant site ended up outside of uh, our protected lands, but it was a site we've been monitoring for decades. But uh, now we've moved into doing land acquisition, working with partners in the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as uh, we've got a county parks department that's real helpful there, as well as uh, a friends group. But uh, this year we participated in the five-year review of the Mitchell Sater Butterfly and provided information uh, we participate in the Mitchell Sater Butterfly Working Group, and uh, we're doing on-site monitoring uh, every year up at our extant site here at Cedar Lake in LaGrange County, right on the uh, very near the Michigan uh, state border. But uh, we've been fortunate. We got the uh, site protected. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, was able to provide the funding through a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funds and uh, acquired the actual site, which is here in pink. And uh, we're working on a, a second acquisition there, which is a potential section, section six, uh, Endangered Species Act dollars. Uh, both the cobblestone tiger beetle and the rusty patch bumblebee, the cobblestone tiger beetle, we're down to one site in Indiana on the whitewater uh, drainage in southeastern Indiana, empties into the Ohio in a it's a real high gradient stream with lots of uh, cobble bars throughout it. 
And there used to be a number of uh, cobblestone tiger beetle uh, cobble bars within this system that they utilized and were reproducing down to one. But uh, it's on our radar. We've kept in touch with the landowner and uh, we do have a, a local professor, Gene Kritsky of Mount St. Joseph. It's in Cincinnati, who's uh, been monitoring them a long time. And uh, he's uh, staying on top of that. And hopefully we can do some land protection for the cobblestone tiger beetle. It's been a challenging one. And the rusty patch bumblebee, uh, you know, the story in Indiana, I think the last one seen was in 2008 had this precipitous decline. They were kind of statewide, but uh, um, Rob Jean, a, a wonderful guy, a PhD RB guy in Indiana. Uh, he works uh, as a private consultant, uh, but he's been doing a lot of work for years on uh, bombus bumblebees in Indiana. And uh, we were just working with him on uh, selecting uh, sites within three priority regions, high probability sites that he has received some funding to uh, survey and and we think we've picked, done pretty good. It's if you see how well he's able to get to them all. Uh, another interesting thing in Indiana, we did complete our Indiana Monarch Conservation Plan. Um, it was uh, kind of a locally funded thing through the Indiana Wildlife, uh, Indiana, uh, the National Wildlife Federation, Indiana Wildlife Federation, our local chapter. And uh, they got some small, small dollars, but basically we held stakeholder groups involving industry agencies, private landowners, uh, and came up with ways to uh, protect lots more habitat in Indiana and got a really good plan in place. Uh, again, we did complete it late in 2020. And uh, we didn't get the agricultural uh, industry to the table as much as we'd like, but that we're continuing to work on that. But uh, with the, sort of shelving, I guess, of the monarch uh, precluded. It's, it's uh, what was the exact terminology? It's deserving of protection, but it was precluded uh, due to the full, full queue of endangered species and it'll be reviewed annually. So Indiana's done a pretty good job of bringing together people that are able to influence the outcome there if, uh, if and when we get to implement. So uh, that is it from Indiana. I just wanted to touch on just a little bit of some highlights on invertebrate protection. And my uh, boss, director, uh, Ron Helmick, is on as well. But uh, invertebrates, the Division of Nature Preserves has jurisdictional authority in the DNR for insects and plants. So uh, we uh, were working with urgency on those. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. That's, uh, that was a great report. And I know that Mike Leahy from Missouri is interested in connecting with you on some of the specifics of the restoration of the reed canary grass infested fen. Yeah. So um, let's we'll see how much time we have here at the end of the meeting. I, I do want to try to keep us on track a bit, but um, if we don't, if we aren't able to circle back to that, Mike and and um, Tom, I hope you can connect. I know you. That's know what that. this all about building a network. Thank you, Lisa. Mike. Thank you so much, Tom. I know you had a lot more than five minutes to say there, so I appreciate it. Next up is Shelby Fulton, and Shelby is with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, and she's going to talk us, to us a little bit about the conservation of the globally rare rattlesnake master borer moth and prescribed fire. All right, Shelby, welcome. All right, can you all see this? I think it should be working. We sure can. All right, great. So as Lisa said, I'm Shelby Fulton. I'm the terrestrial zoologist with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. We are Kentucky's natural heritage agency. And I'm here to talk to you today about how we manage habitat for a very rare species that is also very sensitive to the management that needs to occur on site. If you're not familiar with the rattlesnake master borer moth, it's Papapima oringii. It's a species that is traditionally associated with tall grass prairie or remnants of tall grass prairie. It's globally imperiled. It has a nature serve rank of G1, G2, which means it is considered highly vulnerable to extinction. Until very recently, it was a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act, but it was decided that listing was not warranted. Now, because of this species association with prairie and remnant habitats, fire plays an important role in preserving that specific habitat type. This was noted as early as 1917 when the species was discovered by Henry Bird, who noted that 
Perhaps the reason his colleagues had not encountered this species was due to the lack of fire being applied to the landscapes in which they had been searching. However, for most of its life cycle, this species is extremely vulnerable to fire mortality. From the time the eggs hatch, the caterpillars move to the rattlesnake master plant and they initially bore into the stem and they feed there for the early part of the season. So this first photo on the left was taken on June 1st in 2018. You can see the little bit of a caterpillar butt poking out of the cut area of the stem uh, and copious amounts of caterpillar frass behind it. So if you were to burn the property uh, while the caterpillar is in the stem, it will completely burn up. But as the season progresses, these caterpillars move down into the root of the plant. So this photo on the right was taken in a different year, but this is on July 6th. And you can see the hole where the caterpillar has now bored into the root. If you were to burn past this point, uh, the caterpillars would survive fire. They're insulated in both the root and under the ground. However, you also have to be careful once the caterpillars have pupated um, and emerged as adults. Once the eggs are laid, the eggs are again vulnerable to being burned in fires. So how do we manage the landscape? Well, as a previous presenter said, this is somewhat of a prairie paradox. I really like that phrase. The key here is to know where your population is so that you can define your burn units appropriately. We've conducted various surveys from the time that the species was discovered in Kentucky in, I believe, 91. In 2017, we started doing full censuses. So we would cover the whole property, count every single rattlesnake master plant, check every plant for feeding sign, record GPS coordinates. And that way we know exactly where the population is occurring on the landscape and how large these population cores are. And that provided us with all the information we need to make the most responsible choices. But this is very logistically challenging. It's expensive, it's time consuming. We typically count over 20,000 eryngium stems a year. And just to show you sort of the effort that goes into this in 2019, we had 15 staff members working on this and each of those staff members worked about 30 hours each. So this full census method is not sustainable in the long term. It's very challenging to come up with a study design that will work while being efficient. So we are always open to suggestions if you have any. Here you can see how the burn units at the property have changed over time, both in size and location. The goal here is always to make sure that we don't burn the entire population of the moth at the same time. So although the moth is very sensitive when it's in this early caterpillar stage in the early part of the season, you can still do spring burns as long as your population is large enough to sustain some amount of mortality and your units are small enough and delineated in a spatially appropriate way that avoids burning the whole population. We've also done fall burns, which are uh, generally less risky for this species because they will be insulated in the root later in the season. We also do uh, mechanical treatments as well in particularly sensitive areas. That's all I have. I have plenty more I could say, but that's just our very brief overview of how we're working with this species. My contact information is here if you'd like to reach out to me or if you have, uh, like I said, any suggestions for monitoring caterpillars of the species on the landscape, we'd love to hear from you. Shelby, that was excellent. Thank you so much. And I would encourage anybody to that has questions or, or you know, Shelby just asked for a little advice here um, to go ahead and unmute yourself and just and and uh, ask a question or offer up any information that you might have. Hey, Shelby, this is Chris Newbold. And I'm going to mention that we have rattlesnake moth, rattlesnake master boar moth on a couple of the prairies that we manage here in central Missouri. And we've had pretty decent success using fire in, uh, again, not burning the entire prairie, but using fire in, in August and September. Because again, that species 
you can't use it everywhere on the prairie because you're going to negatively impact, impact some things, but that species will survive those fires, emerge, and come out and recolonize the area that you just burnt immediately. Yeah, thank you. That's great. We are definitely uh, looking at doing some later summer to early fall burning. Again, you may have negative impacts on other things. So you have to weigh that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in the group doing work on rattlesnake master borer moth? Shall well, we uh, oh. Chris, um, this is Mike Leahy, and maybe Steve Bubeck could chime in. I think he's on the call too. We just did presence absence monitoring, right, for rattlesnake borer moth in Missouri. We didn't we didn't do a population estimate like like Shelby has done. No, we basically just said, is it here or not here, and is it yeah, where's it at? Super, and, and Jessica Peterson is in Minnesota is um, just letting us know they, that they don't have known populations, but they've thought about looking for them. So maybe this presentation will encourage some of that work. Definitely, it's a great species. Super. Shelby, this is Roger from, from Tennessee. Does this uh, species or also anyone if there's from Arkansas, does it occur on your southern border? I'm wondering if it's something we should be looking for in some of our grassland habitats in Tennessee. In Kentucky, it's more in the central to western part of the state. Um, I know Jim Best has looked in Tennessee. I don't believe he's ever found it. I suppose you all would know if he had, uh, but he would be the guy to talk to about which areas in Tennessee might be good habitat. So I can uh, give you his contact information if you don't already know him. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank sure. you. Hey, Roger, this is Theo Whistle. Um, we get it at your latitude for sure. Um, I could get you some sites um, if you're interested. Yeah, I think maybe, you know, just get some information to some of our staff, Theo, and then we maybe in the future could queue up a survey for it. Ed Corey's um, offering that it's also known from North Carolina. And then Mike, I think Mike Leahy has something to offer there to Ryan Klopf that they may, that Virginia might want to think about it at Difficult Creek Natural Areas or Natural Area Preserve with the Eryngium yuccafolium. So great. This is, um, this is great work, Shelby. Thank you uh, for sharing that with us. And uh, keep, uh, we'll look forward to some updates on how that work goes, continues to go. Thank you all. Super. Rick is with the Virginia Department of Conservation and, and Recreation and the Division of Natural Heritage and, um, and the Virginia Natural Areas Preserve System um, is what he is here to talk about today and the work that they are doing to protect habitat for rare inverts with a focus on monitoring, conducting specific management practices to enhance habitat and tailoring management to avoid impacts. So Rick? Yeah, I'll just... Uh add to what Lisa said. Um, I'm the stewardship program manager with the Virginia DCR Natural Heritage Program. Our heritage program is a division within a, an agency and state government in Virginia. And within the heritage program, we've got a, a full-blown natural areas program as well. Um, and I am the stewardship program manager. And this will be a non-technical sort of overview introduction to some invertebrate conservation work we do in Virginia. I'll tag team with Ryan Clough, who is also uh, gonna be part of this very brief um, set of examples of some of the work we do. We've, we've got a very aggressive uh, land protection program that is the basis of the natural areas program in Virginia. So we, we do everything we can to find as much money as possible from any source available to, to actually purchase and own and manage land to support natural heritage resources, which includes habitat for rare species of, of inverts. Really quickly, uh, our preserve system is now currently consists of 65 preserves, getting close to 60,000 acres across the state as of this year. Um, we protect habitats for federally listed species, state rare plants and animals, examples of natural communities. Uh, 45 of the preserves in the system are owned by uh, our agency, have partners that own the others. We work in partnership with them on management issues. Um, our, the Virginia Natural Heritage Program tracks 616 species of invertebrate animals and an estimated 50 species are protected on the preserve system consisting of butterflies, dragonflies, moths, beetles, cave invertebrates, and one bug. So people ask this question all the time and I think the answer probably is pretty uniform with other natural areas programs around 
the country. First and foremost priority is to protect habitat for rare species and natural community examples. Research and education are a secondary objective. And then third, still important, we do compatible public outdoor recreation opportunities on about one third of the 65 preserves statewide. Quick map, I'm gonna, we're gonna be talking about species of invertebrates all the way from the Eastern shore um, to Lee County on the far Western corner of the state. And about five examples, five or six examples across Virginia. Next slide, Ryan. So on the Eastern shore of Virginia, uh, on the Bay side, um, along with eight other natural area preserves in Virginia, we have purchased land and managed resources, uh, in, um, especially for maintaining, protecting habitat from northeastern beach tiger beetles, which is a federally threatened, state threatened listed species, um, declining due to lots of reasons, but largely due to historically in the last maybe 60 years or so, especially due to human impacts and adverse impacts from recreational use of sandy shorelines around the Chesapeake Bay and, and in northeastern United States. Um, and then more recently, the bigger threat, I think, and most in Virginia agree is, is rapid sea level rise. These habitats are disappearing fast due to um, increased shoreline erosion and more frequent severe storms causing overwash and beach rollover. Um, and only really one of the preserves in Virginia where we protect habitat for this species of a rare invertebrate is what I would call in good shape for the longer term because it has a lot of topography. There's 50 foot dunes adjacent to these shorelines and it'll take a long time for sea level to, to um, work and erosion to happen in such a way that habitat is eliminated. But the, the other eight preserves are really close to sea level and they're gonna, they are currently taking it on the chin due to that, that related impact of, of rapid climate change. Next slide. In the southeastern part of the state, we, um, we do quite a bit of prescribed burning to maintain pine savanna habitat, similar to habitats further south and then to Florida and west to Texas. We are actively doing longleaf pine restoration in Virginia, have res restored or at least established longleaf pine, which is a rare species in Virginia, rare plant species, um, to over 1,500 acres of longleaf pine planting so far on the state natural area preserve system. Um, within that sort of landscape matrix of habitats, uh, this species of butterfly, the frosted elfin, is, um, is represented at least at two preserves where it uh, thrives on its host plant in Virginia, uh, wild lupin. And our hope is that as we expand this work and time prescribed burns appropriately, we expand habitat for this particular animal and we see increases in its population. Okay, and so now we're going to Ryan. pitch it over to me for a little bit. I'll talk about uh, invertebrates at three preserves that I manage. Uh, the first I want to talk about is in the southern Blue Ridge. High up there's this uh, wet meadow system at Camp Ranch Wetlands, which is a privately owned natural area preserve. And here uh, we have the Mitchell Sater butterfly is one of our EOs. Um, and this butterfly inhabits this mosaic of wet meadows within this uh, private property that's managed as a farm. Um, as it's private property and managed agriculturally, uh, one of the management approaches we've taken here is to, with funding from NRCS, build fencing to exclude livestock to reduce impacts of the livestock on water quality. Specific concern is elevated nitrogen levels in the water from the livestock can reduce the competitive, competitive ability of the sedge species that you see in this photograph, which in high nutrient environment is replaced by rushes. And the sedge is the critical host plant for that butterfly. In addition, um, we have to manage this site uh, mechanically to keep uh, woody encroachment down, lest it shade out the sedge. Um, from the Southern Blue Ridge, taking a, a big trip to the east in the historic Piedmont Savanna region of Virginia, we have a preserve that sounds very similar to some of the preserves the other speakers uh, manage in the Midwest, where we have a very rich grassland habitat that we're restoring, uh, you can see in the background there. And here, after over a decade of fire management, thinning, and invasive species management, uh, we found uh, a new record for this site, the model Duskywing, shown here. 
the host plant of this species uh, fits nicely into that prairie paradox, great phrase from earlier, uh, New Jersey tea, which is a, a little shrub, native shrub uh, promoted uh, by fire, benefits from fire. Um, but of course, this species is very sensitive to fire at any time of year. So our approach here to balance the, this uh, dichotomy um, is to, um, uh, we've, we manage Difficult Creek as eight fire management units. And we know which units this butterfly has been uh, counted in. Uh, we know where the males have been counted and we know where the one female has been counted. And so we just uh, apply fire in a mosaic, um, leaving a certain proportion of the habitat unburned in any given year. So that's our current approach to our prairie paradox with the model dusky wing. And then the last place I'm gonna share with you um, is, is not unfamiliar to many of you who um, tuned into my talk this past summer, but also in the Southern Blue Ridge is Buffalo Mountain Natural Area Preserve. And at the top of Buffalo Mountain is a grassland habitat that contains the world's only population of this Buffalo Mountain mealybug shown here, which lives on uh, native grasses atop Buffalo Mountain, primarily big blue stem. Just a few hundred, hundred individuals have been counted there. And our management for this species uh, really takes um, hits on three things. One is just monitoring population counts. Two is monitoring the grassland habitat extent spatially using both drone imagery and historic imagery that show us uh, how the grassland uh, area has changed over the past um, few decades. And then third, trying to manage public access in a way that limits the extent of uh, the public's footprint atop Buffalo Mountain in these sensitive habitats. So that's a whirlwind tour of these three species on these three preserves. And then last slides for Rick here. Yeah, before leaving, I wanted to brag a little bit on our natural heritage zoologists. Um, we've gotten into bees in the last few years and along with some other states that have been surveying for rusty patch bumblebee. Um, additional recent surveys by our zoologists, in particular, Ellison Orcutt, give him a shout out uh, we found further evidence of a significant population of rusty patch bumblebee in the central Appalachians um, during the 2020 field season. This concluded at least 19 individuals were observed among three populations in the Ridge, Ridge and Valley province of Virginia. And somewhat in conjunction with the fact that we know this species is now in Virginia and that there's a population um, big enough to, to find more often than just one and two, one or two here and there. We are actively pursuing acquisition of a new natural area preserve in that part of Virginia that supports a known rusty patch bee population um, and a, an occurrence and then plus a, an adjacent or associated old growth forest. So that's in the works and we're hoping it works out. And if so, we'll add this species to our list of those conserved and protected on Virginia state lands managed by DCR. Great. I think that's it, Lisa. Thank you, Rick and Ryan, so much, and appreciate your, your patience there. Um, if you can answer this in a minute, I'm going to ask this question from Ed Corey. Is the preference for mechanical management over fire at the Mitchell Sater site due to the size of the management area? Um, I'll take that one real quickly and just say that we, we actually do do um, plan, we are talking about uh, plans to do some fire management at that site as well. Um, so it's, uh, it, it hasn't been done, but it's, it's included as a possible management tool in our, in our management plan. And the way we would manage um, fire there is the Mitchell Sater inhabit five separate habitats within that site. So we'd take a very conservative approach if we were to apply fire and burn the least populous site of those five first uh, and couple that with some intensive monitoring. Um, so stay tuned. Okay, great, thank you very much. All right, we have Patty Vitt who is going to fill in for Jim Anderson. Um, Patty, are you, are you, you wanna show yourself there? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks Patty. And Patty is um, with the Lake County Forest Preserves and again, habitat restoration for invertebrates across several natural communities and geographic areas where monitoring is a critical need. Thanks, Patty. Um, sure, thank you. We don't have a uh, formal presentation, so I'm just gonna provide a little bit of an overview of what we are doing. Uh, our primary focus uh, for invertebrates is to really uh, just establish really good management and restoration of our natural areas. 
And that includes things like trying to um, ensure as broad uh, seed diversity in our mix, uh, including things that are um, early spring flowering all the way through the flowering season to uh, support as many pollinators uh, as possible across the full season. Um, we also do a lot of clearing in our understory areas um, to uh, ensure that the ground vegetation is diverse and also supplies a lot of uh, resources for insects of all kinds. Um, and the, I guess the proof is in the pudding kind of thing. Um, at one of our higher quality areas um, uh, called Ryerson, um, we do have uh, uh, some bumblebee monitoring, actually just regular bees, all bees that have been monitored. And 49 species um, have been found there, including uh, one that is a state record. Um, so that speaks to us about the quality of the management of our remnant natural areas, ensuring that those resources are still available for as broad a variety of insects as possible. Um, we also do um, sort of uh, broader scale restoration, and another one of our uh, sites, Pine Dunes, um, we have had monitoring for bumblebees in particular done by the Illinois Natural History Survey. And the survey has found um, two species of um, species of special concern here in Illinois, including the half black bumblebee. Uh, and so that also, you know, speaks to us that our restorations um, also provide resources for a variety of species. Um, we don't currently have an insect uh, ecologist on staff, and so we rely on contractors and students um, and other researchers throughout the area to provide some of these data. Um, and so that includes people who do um, uh, surveys for um, auditory surveys for singing insects, and so some of those um, would include bush crickets and meadow katydids that are being monitored. Um, and then we have volunteers who monitor things like butterflies um, and um, dragonflies uh, throughout the preserves of the district. Um, and then somebody mentioned something about um, fire and timing of fire and how that can impact um, uh, insects. And so uh, we burn very early in the spring uh, before many insects are, um, you know, sort of, they're still dormant, hopefully underground. We also burn very late in the fall, again, when most insects are probably dormant. Um, but on top of that, we also burn our habitats in the mosaic. There are very few places that are burned. Um, annually, uh, mostly if you know, one management area might get burned in one year and then the next year another one will get burned within the same reserve. So we try and provide a mosaic of burn ages within each of our habitat sites. And that's really um, that's just a really broad overview of what we're doing in Lake County and Illinois. Thank you so much, Patty. Uh, we really appreciate you stepping in there at the last minute. Okay, next up, we have Amber Beth Van Ningen with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Science and Natural Areas Program uh, to give us an overview of insect research, including forest bee inventories, rare skipper butterfly management, and lepidopter and peatland surveys that she's involved in in Minnesota. Thanks, Amber Beth. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully everybody can see my screen and can hear me. I'm Amber Beth Van Ningen. I am the Regional Specialist for the Scientific and Natural Areas Program in Northeast Minnesota. And a few of my colleagues are on the call today, too, so I'm just going to give a quick shout out to them, to Erica Priest, our naturalist here in the Northeast, our prairie biologist, Judy Schulte, and two of the biologists from our biological survey are on as well, uh, the real experts, Jessica Peterson and Nicole Gerjets. So I'm just going to give a very rapid fire overview of some of the invertebrate monitoring on our SNAs we have going in Minnesota, and they're all insects, starting with a couple of monitoring projects for listed skipper species. 
So the Dakota skipper is both federally and state listed. The Leonard skipper is a state listed species. Both are associated with prairies, probably having something to do with why they are listed species. And they've both been involved in um, some monitoring projects over for the last couple of years and continuing monitor projects. The Dakota skipper, we've been employing a transect method to look at larval host plant and adult nectar resources. And the Leonard skipper, we've been testing out a point count distance sampling monitoring method. And you can see those methods kind of tried to illustrate them in the photos there. And both of these monitoring projects also have the uh, added benefit of looking at management. So either looking at a response to management or developing a management framework. So these are prairie systems. Those management Activities would include prescribed fire, haying and grazing, and also rest periods between those active management. Next project to highlight uh, brings a little closer to home for me, so we don't have any prairies here in Northeast Minnesota, but we do have peatlands. Uh, in fact, we have the largest peatlands in the United States outside of Alaska. And Kyle Johnson leads this project for us and um, has for uh, several years. And a lot of these peatlands, these large peatland areas are, at least the core of them, are protected as state scientific and natural areas. And even in 2020, with all the difficulties of getting into the field and coordinating stuff, Kyle was still able to get out to eight of the large peatland complexes and was able to survey multiple peatland habitats over a variety of seasons. And that's the photos in the background here that Kyle provided as the four seasons at the Red Lake peatland in north central Minnesota, the largest peatland in the state. Some quick results from Kyle surveys in 2020. He found six to perhaps over 800 species documented in his surveys. And those include some rarely seen species, some range extensions and species found that give us more information on that, and at least two potential new species to science. Another project, uh, this is statewide, but also close to home for me in, in the Northeast, is the statewide bee survey. The, this project is to create a state species list of Minnesota bees and then to help inform pollinator and education outreach. So the methods for this are mostly bowl trapping and hand netting. And this work has been focused primarily at SNA, scientific and natural areas across the state. You can see a little bit of a hole up there in Northeast Minnesota, too. so the survey is coming our way. In fact, I got to help with it a couple of years ago, and Erica, our naturalist, is going to be helping Nicole with it this year, too. So we'll be expanding those dots into more SNAs. But so far, there have been surveys on 64 SNAs out of about 170 total SNAs that we have in our program. This project has found about 144 species, including three locations of the federally listed rusty patch bumblebee, and two new state records um, for species that I'm not going to try to pronounce right now, but from what I understand, the first species listed there is a species of minor bee and the second a species of sweat bee. So that was very fast. I know it was just some quick projects that we have going on, but I wanted to give some acknowledgements to uh, Jessica, Nicole, and Kyle. They are our biological survey staff working on these projects. And they were so kind to let me steal slides from their longer and really great presentations that they have on these projects. Many thanks to the biological survey too, which is the program they work for. It's a program ours. Uh, coordinates with a lot, and thanks to the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund that funds a lot of their work and a lot of our work as well. And then I will just leave uh, this slide last up there, which gives you some um, contact information for the biological survey staff. The first three that I mentioned there, and Jessica and Nicole are both on this call. Judy, who's our Prairie biologist, Eric and I, that work in the Northeast. If you want any information on Northeast or general SNA stuff, and then I left uh, the uh, general SNA email on there as well if you have any just across the board questions for us. Very fast, but hopefully give you an idea of what we're up to here in Minnesota. Fantastic. Thank you, Amber Beth. That's great. And Jessica, I don't, or I'm sorry, not Jen. Uh, yeah, Jessica, I don't know if you're, um, if you, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Ronald Helmick asked a question that you answered in, in chat. It, it might be good just to put it out there for everybody to hear. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if that was correct. The question was directed towards what Amberbeth was talking about or not, but um, we're really excited to do some haying um, to uh, help some of these skippers. Um, haying has kind of traditionally uh, been, you know, something of, as was mentioned at the very beginning with the regals has helped these prairie butterflies. And so our hands are kind of tied with respect to the federally listed species and what we are and are not allowed to do management wise. And so um, we're excited to get some hang back on the, on, on our SNAs and help out these skippers. But yeah, we, we, we removed the vegetation um, certainly. Otherwise it would kill the grass that they need as well as potentially the skippers. Okay, thanks. And and just real quick, if you can answer this in like 30 seconds or less, who identifies your bee species? And do you have an entomologist on staff or do you send them out for ice? Sure. Yeah, um, Nicole Gurgis is on the call too. She's um, trained in bee identification. We do the primary identification and then we send it to um, a taxonomist at the University of Minnesota, Zach Portman, for our final um, confirmation. <laughs> it's <Okay>. hard. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Minnesota. We appreciate um, that sweet update. Yeah, I think um, we've we've undergone a pretty radical change of thinking that's been been more or less talked about by several other presenters. Where you know we used to burn as much as possible, as frequently as we could. In some cases, uh, twenty five years ago, when I first started uh, on the burn crew, there we would. Uh, We'd burn the whole prairie uh, remnant and we'd burn it um, in the spring a lot of times, uh, April, May. Uh, didn't really like the long-term results we were seeing with that sort of management uh, in terms of the flora or the fauna and have really evolved to, you know, we have this understanding that you're always going to favor something and, and impact something no matter what you do, when you do your management. But trying to f strike that balance between doing the most good and the least harm uh, as we can. And, and a big part of that in Arkansas um, has been to sort of look at the evidence of when fires happened historically. What is the uh, historic range of variation for fire seasonality in the landscape? And that comes from a variety of sources. There's a sort of an increasing abundance of of dendroecological data, looking at fire scar studies and trees um, in different landscapes, which is a great data set. Uh, we've consulted with archaeologists that know a lot about Native American uh, fire and, and other land management. And we've looked at the incidence of lightning ignited fires dating back to when the Forestry Commission which is our state forestry agency began to keep data um, looking at, you know, every time there'd be a fire that was reported that they would have to put out, they would record the ignition source. So when were lightning set fires in the year, it turns out in the interior highlands, the, the Washita mountains is in particular where a particular study was done <clears throat> looking at that. It was August, September, October, uh, a lot of the anthropogenic fire, almost all of it, is in the late fall to the dormant season. Um, but then the other big sort of evolution in our management has been to really insist on multiple burn units. And even we have some very small prairie remnants, and there's a lot of resistance to splitting up, uh, say, an eight-acre prairie into multiple burn units. But uh, we're doing that now and, and trying to really – just sort of be kind of humble about what we know and, and we don't know and erring on the side of caution, being more conservative with, of course, continuing to use fire. We like Apache burn as well. I was like to hear um, the talk where they talked about a 70% coverage being, being a good, uh, a good result, a desired condition uh, or desired results. So I don't really have anything specific to say other than that, but I was glad to, to hear the other discussion about this and would welcome more information uh, on, um, on uh, not just invertebrate um, response to fire seasonality and intensity and other things, but, but other fauna as well, uh, herbs in particular. That's all I, I really had. Thank you. Hey, Theo, this is Bill Holloman again. So uh, could you address how we've started rethinking 
our seasonality of burns in regards to where we are trying to do fewer spring burns? Sure. So, um, yeah, back to that historic, um, the evidence of when his fires were occurred historically, there was very little evidence of any spring fire, uh, at least on any scale, uh, in any of the, the data that we've been able to, to access. And, and we, I would also include historical accounts. There's a lot of historical uh, written accounts of, of when things burned, uh, early settler accounts, and explorers, and so on. And just looking at all that data set, deciding and, and seeing prairies, especially that we used to burn in the spring, lose their spring flora. And not just prairies, woodlands, other sites really decline uh, and become more weedy. Um, trying not to, to inflict the most damage necessarily with a burn on the vegetation. Uh, and, and embracing backing fire, which I also in, enjoyed seeing some of that earlier. And, you know, we don't think we have all the answers, but we're, we, we like what we see better with that and, and really trying to stop burning before the spring flora starts to break its buds at the ground, which in some cases in Southern Arkansas could be even in mid February, although not this year, it's going to be very cold next week. Um, does that answer the question, Bill? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Thea. So anyway, um, using photography, um, I, have been doing butterfly surveys for about 25 years, and we always use photography on butterflies. So, you know, we would occasionally net them, but by and large, uh, the person that trained me uh, did not uh, kill butterflies. He always wanted to photograph them, identify them on the wings. So that's kind of how I was taught. So when the question came up, uh, I really have gotten into uh, insects a lot within the last four years and using my camera, uh, which I absolutely love. And the websites iNaturalist and uh, Bug Guide have been tremendous because I've been connected with a whole lot of experts that can help me learn insects better. So whenever I hear the question of, well, we don't know enough, we don't know enough about insects, we can't determine their status, we can't add more to our endangered species list, to our species of graze need conservation because we don't have enough historic data. Uh, that frustrated me. Why are we just throwing our hands up and saying, um, you know, we don't have enough, go out and get it. So I went out to get it. So for the last three years, I set up a survey by which I visit six sites a year um, on our nature preserves. Basically, these are protected sites. They're all 10 acres in size or larger. I visit them four times a year, uh, uh, April, May, June, July, and August, September. Um, I go about 60 to 80 minutes. I do a meandering transects and I hit the best floral spots. I want to get as many pollinators as possible. I photograph first and then I record. It's just me and a clipboard and a camera. Um, I occasionally bring vials and I catch some bees and send them up to Laura Anchor for uh, identification of the more difficult species. Uh, but I've gotten pretty good at this and I've gotten really good with my camera. So I am able to photograph about 94% of all the different species that I think I see. Of course, everything can't be identified to species. Some things are only identified to genus or tribe or, or even family in some cases of the flies. Um, so species is kind of a loose term. I don't, this is the best I can do. Sometimes I do tachinid fly one, tachinid fly two, uh, assuming these are different species. In some cases, I'm probably repeating. In some cases, um, probably uh, not undercounting, overcounting. Uh, it's the best I can do. My goals are to establish a baseline of what species are on my different preserves. I want to find specialist pollinators uh, in the different communities like hill prairies and forests and wetlands. And I want to obtain new ideas for guiding our management. We already manage a lot of these sites, uh, not all of them. Um, and I wanted to collect information on potentially how we can determine natural area quality based on the insects. Uh, like I said, I'm visiting six sites a year. These are all over 10 acres, replicate the surveys every five years. I'm on year number three right now. So two more years and I'll start repeating. Uh, surveys four times during the season to catch as many pollinators as possible. And I document everything, photograph first, record second. So here's my results. Uh, so, so far I've gotten almost 700 different species, uh, 1,200, 352 individuals on uh, 209 different plant species. Uh, my maximum efficiency is about 400 individuals per hour. If I'm by myself, uh, 55 species per hour is about the best I can do because I have to record them as well. Um, I did have an assistant with me, a volunteer who was 
fantastic scribe for me. She can basically understand when I go back and forth between common and scientific names. And we got up to 69 species in an hour um, with her help. Um, 2020 started out kind of a cool, wet spring. Uh, so I got less species and individuals that year. I did a lot more uh, grassland prairie areas in the first two years. And so I would expect to get a higher diversity on those sites. And the plants, you know, I'm trying to record. I don't record every single observation. In other words, if an insect visits the plant each time, I don't record it. I just record all the different types of plants that that insect is going to. So it doesn't necessarily show preference other than what species are visiting what plant. Interestingly, some of these plants are non-natives. Wild parsnip is hugely important for a lot of pollinators. So when we do management, I want to start thinking more about planting members of that carrot family, golden alexanders, meadow parsnip, uh, water hemlock, things like that, that would be important food sources for these uh, pollinators. Uh, we really do need to think about when we get rid of autumn olive, what are we going to do for all the bumblebees that are feeding on autumn olive? Uh, this is my key slide. Um, we've been talking fairly conservative about how to do management to conserve insects. Now, a lot of the sites I'm working on, we don't have any really fire-dependent conservative insects yet. If we find them, we obviously adapt and we obviously make sure to leave particular refugia areas that are needed by those species. But by and large, what I'm really trying to do is find out what's on the landscape. I want to know what's there and we want to manage sometimes, really manage pretty hard to get the habitat up to where we actually can attract these species. A lot of these sites are large, so burning uh, doesn't necessarily take away um, from the refugia. There's still other areas where they can migrate back in. But so far, of the three sites I've looked at that are having high intensity management, in other words, two, to, they, two fires or more in five years that are really hot and clearing, we are actually clearing trees with fecon heads and majorly make, creating more grassland habitat, essentially. And then we burn these areas and we're seeing amazing results. Even some of the fire dependent insects are coming into these areas from refugia and we can find them. We got to know that they're there before we can manage them. Also, the number of individuals seems to be much higher in these transformatively managed areas. Interestingly enough, the moderately low intensity management is about the same as no management. Some of our sites have received no management for various reasons. Uh, sometimes the landowners do not want, private landowners don't want their sites managed. But once you start managing an area, if you don't keep up with that management, the invasives basically are under attack. And so they basically rally and produce even more stems or whatever. And sometimes you go backwards a little bit. And that's why I think that the moderate low intensity is about the same as no management. Sometimes you're going backwards. And until you have the resources to do more intensive management, um, you don't make any gains, at least as far as pollinators. I do look at a lot of the uh, state listed plants. We have a lot more plants than we do insects on our list. Uh, and I try to document all the, what I think are the pollinators, the chief pollinators for these species. And I submit that to our database. Endangered and threatened species, the greatest needed conservation and our watch list insects. Uh, like I said, we don't have a lot of insects listed for Illinois. So I want to document everything because you never know when a common insect today might be scarce in 10 or 20 years. You just don't know. And we need the data so we can determine the status. So essentially, here's the results. We had, of my 18 sites, I had monarchs on 15. Uh, the American bumblebee was on five sites, Bumbus, Pennsylvania. They're breeding in my backyard. I'm not so sure that one should be listed federally. Um, what I learned, diversity was good at all the nature preserves. These sites are providing critical habitat that are kind of protected from pesticide drift. Uh, some of the non-native plants are serving as critical food sources. So we need to think about that when we eliminate these non-native plants. I'm not saying don't eliminate them, please do. But think about the foods that you are providing for the pollinators. The impact of the honeybees seems to be minimal in West Central Illinois, which is where I work. Uh, community associations are problematic. In other words, these insects do not stay on the hill prey. They do not stay in the wetland. They move around. They may go to a specific plant, but they do not stay on a specific community. So that's becoming really difficult. But I really think this transformative management uh, is important. And with that, uh, it wraps it up. I really apologize for this. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much for sharing that interesting project, though, Angela. I do appreciate it. Um, Okay, great. Let me just um, wrap us up here. 
I uh, first off, I want to just thank all of our presenters from Chris to the to the eight folks who were willing to just do those mini presentations, um, those quickies and share what's going on in their states. Again, we'll, we'll share the recording. We'll share the chat. We will share the contact information for those presenters so that you all can be back in touch with those those presenters. We're going to continue to do this. So mark your calendars. May 11th and August 10th are um, two more roundtables that are on the calendar. The committee will convene to um, determine what subjects uh, make sense uh, to dig deep into for this group. But please send us your ideas. If there is something that that you're struggling with or challenged with and you think others in your um other peers are struggling with the same thing. Let us know. We'll try to put some um, presentations together. And if you, if you know of good presenters, we're open to those as well. Our hope is on the November 16th uh, roundtable to have that be more of the traditional roundtable where folks are coming together and um, having open discussion and sharing of just you know, diversity of, of topics. So we'll, we'll put more meat to the bones on that and share that idea with you in the near future, but uh, know that there's some active planning going on. And for anybody that's interested, um, please uh, reach out to us. And as always, uh, great work, continue to do this great work. It is, um, it's the important work and we're happy to, to be here as the Natural Areas Association supporting you in that work. Uh, let us know how we can best do that and consider becoming members if you're not. That way you can have access to even more good information. All right, everybody, take care and uh, I'll, yeah, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it. I appreciate, appreciate your participation today. Take care.